Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the New Books in Science, Technology, and Society, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm your host, Jake Chaninson. Today, we'll be talking with Chris Wiggins and Matthew Jones, both professors at Columbia University. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us, Jake. Yeah, thank you. Of course. Today, we'll be talking about their new book, How Data Happened, a history from the age of reason to the age of algorithms. And to start off, I'm wondering if both of you could speak to how you guys came to co-write this book together. Well, uh, we have the benefit of both teaching at Columbia. I, I went to a talk that Matt gave many, 10 years ago, actually 10 years ago this spring, Matt gave a great talk on the, on the history of machine learning, which was a topic of, of interest to me. And uh, about a year later, we ended up being asked to participate in a brand new class, a summer course for teaching data journalism to new to journalism students, uh, which was great fun. And it, and it gave us a chance to see how we might come up with a curriculum together in Python, but but about the ways that data relates to our understanding of society and to how we think of data, not only functionally, but in terms of as a rhetorical craft and, and also the critical skills around making sense of data when, when we're investigating somebody else's stories. Matt, how does it, but that Matt, how do you remember it? So no, no, that's right. So we uh, we were teaching that class, and um, I had Chris over for dinner with a bunch of students in uh, in, in in my at my house because I live in the Columbia dorm and have regular events with students. And uh, as we were talking, the students said, "Well, you two ought to teach a class." And then we had the opportunity to be part of a a program that encouraged teaching across divisions, teaching across social sciences and the sciences. Um, and so we came up with a class, which was uh, both a, a history of the development of statistics and um, the data sciences, uh, and also sort of adopted some of those lessons we'd learned from teaching practices of data. And we wanted to think about how it is that we could empower um undergraduate students, both students from uh, a more humanistic background and students from a more technical uh, computer science background, what kind of additional sets of capacities and skills could we offer them, both about how to think critically about the development of uh, the techniques for handling uh, and thinking through data, um, and then actually doing it uh, as a sort of programming task and balance those two things. And out of this curriculum out of these 14 weeks, uh, after a few years, after we transitioned from teaching as a small seminar into more of a lecture course, we realized we really had uh, a framework um, for telling a a story, a story that went from uh, a a bunch of subject that's more familiar to historians of science about the early development of statistics to a lot of domains that are much less charted uh, about the expansion of data um, after World War II and the creation of new new disciplines and new er areas of study like pattern recognition, machine learning, uh, and, and, and today the data sciences and what has been branded AI. And so that, that was really the genesis of, of, of the book. Uh, and along the way, we became a, more attuned by virtue of interventions of students uh, about how it is that hi- our historical story could inform uh, a narrative about what it is we do today, a narrative about power, a narrative about ethics. Um, and so it's, it developed as a book that was at once intended to be rigorously historical, but rigorously historical concerned with, uh, uh, you know, deep ethical and political questions of the moment. Sort of the first chapter of your book, you guys mentioned that data is made, not found. Where does data start to become being made? I like that quote. Um, <laughs> it's a great quote. <laughs> Good. Um, well, the history of statistics, I, I tend to think about these things perhaps a little unorthodox in the way that I think about the history of things, which is I often get fixated on the words and their etymologies and their origin. But I think a lot of times those those stories have good lessons. So statistics is a good one because the word statistics originally had nothing to do with math or even numbers. It had to do with statecraft, right? That's That's why the word is statistics. And not long after the word enters the English language in 1770 by translation, you get these great fights 
between statisticians for whom making sense of the state through narrative understanding and investigative understanding of the greatness of the men who run these countries is contested by people who think we should make tables of countries where every row is a table and the columns might be the area or the population or uh, some measure of wealth. And you get these fights where for the for the high statisticians, those statisticians are mere table makers. They are vulgar statisticians. And that story, I think it's useful as we look back on the changing nature of different terms of art that we use now and the repeated contestations of different fields of human knowledge, which are challenged throughout our last couple of centuries when that field becomes data-driven or at least has its data moment. So some transition happens sometimes in technology and sometimes simply in mindset. So sometimes tool set leads mindset and sometimes mindset changes and people realize actually you could answer these questions quantitatively and there begins a fight. And we, and, and I think those fights are, are useful stories to trace through history to see how things didn't have to be the way they are now. Actually, plenty of people argued um, at these transition moments that something was being lost when we gained quantification and the understanding of these fields. So when we tell the story of statistics, we start with that entry point and trace it all the way through the moment or the, the era at which statistics becomes something much more like what we recognize today, where it's a shorthand for an academic field formerly known as mathematical statistics. Yeah, and we pick up not necessarily with the very first time people began recording large amounts of data in meaning numerical data, as we would call it, and that would be a history that goes back to Babylonian times, but rather at a moment where there's an explosion, the beginnings of an explosion of that kind of numerical data, along with an effort to take tools from uh, mathematical astronomy, which had gained you know, incredibly new prestige over the course of the 18th century, and to see those tools as new forms of authoritative knowledge that might be applied to primarily numerical uh, data. So we begin at this early 19th century moment, precisely because it's where you see the intersection of the accumulation of numerical data and new forms of, of evaluation of it that uh, make claims to authority as a new form of knowledge appropriate to morality, the state, science, and other domains. I'm really glad you mentioned mora- more, excuse me, morality in that last claim, um, because in the book you guys have a section on uh, institutionalizing biometrics, where the statecraft of statistics starts to take an interesting turn when it comes to power, race, and class. I was wondering if you guys would be interested in discussing that. Well, I think it's kind of disingenuous to teach the history of statistics without engaging in what were the interests of the people developing those terms, um, and particularly for correlation and regression that were both coined by uh, Sir Francis Galton, who also gave us the word eugenics. So for him, one of the areas that he was taking mathematical methods for making sense of data and applying it to a very different field was an understanding society and the greatness of different families, his own family included, uh, and the greatness of the Victorian empire and how you know he and other thinkers, you know Florence Nightingale and other thinkers of the late Victorian era were very interested in how they could put data to work in a way to ensure the continued greatness of the British Empire. This was late, late Victorian era. So um, that is a, that's a style of, of analysis and a dynamic of power, because clearly Galton was coming from the empowered class, which we can look back and, and, and say, oh, it's obvious that that was you know, a, a, the wrong way and an unethical way to think about data. But if you read what he's writing, you know, he's not writing about how he thinks he have, he's going to be perpetuating oppression. He writes from the, the voice of somebody who thinks he's very progressive and thinks that he's doing something that's going to be good for society. So that's the lesson that I think is useful to teach is, first of all, you can't shy away from what were the interests of the people who developed these methods and, and what, what did they think they were perpetuating. But also, as practitioners, I think it's we have to maintain some self-skepticism that we go into these problems and we focus on how much benefit we're going to do to a particular group, for example, and we forget to question, well, are they consenting to this? Or uh, we think about how much benefit we're going to create, and then we forget to think, is this benefit allocated in a way that is just? Is it equal? Is it fair? Does it redress oppression? 
and that um, that difficulty, I think, is one of the things that I, it's useful to take a, a faraway time, like the late Victorian era, and see what has changed and what's the same as we as we investigate our own time. Yeah, and one of the things I think we're concerned to do is both to really show how significant statistics was for rethinking uh, racial categories, uh, gender categories, and other sorts of things as a new sort of uh, authoritative kind of science, and yet never to say, well, j- therefore statistics boils down to or can be reduced to that sort of uh, th- that sort of uh, uh, power, in, uh, you know, con- uh, th- th- those sorts of power interests. And so we give an example of a, a, a fight between someone who was very prominent at the time, uh, who was working on uh, the statistics of blacks and whites and uh, colonial peoples around the world and their insurability, um, who gets into a, a, a fight uh, with the, the great American sociologist, black sociologist Du Bois, who um, uses statistics to show the, the, the problems of the inferences he's drawing. So it becomes an argument both using tools of statistics to make arguments. So it doesn't quite boil down to power. That's not all it is. But to not uh, look at power relations is to not understand the matrix in which it, um, uh, statistics developed and came to uh, assume the authority that it continues to have to this day. It's also useful because the rest of the book is going to be about data and truth and data and power. And uh, we need for the reader, or in, this, in our case, the students in the class, to get in the habit of questioning who is developing these new techniques, who has access to data and who doesn't, who are, what are the interests of the people who are developing these capabilities, and how do those capabilities serve to reinforce existing power dynamics? I really appreciated that you mentioned uh, data and truth. Um, this book, one of the many things in this book that surprised and delighted me was the fact that uh, you guys make mention of massive data collection efforts going on before the 21st century um, and the human labor involved in actually collecting data. So how has the mechanics and cost of data collection changed over time in the time period you examine in this book? Well, there's been a massive change in the scale of collection data, but also in the processing of data. So we we do take some pains to talk about how, for example, um, you know, Ketley was able to get some of his data in the mid 19th century from soldiers, right? Which is to say there has to be an army and there has to be a state that's collecting those data or um, he's gathering data from prison records. So again, there has to be a state and then Ketley has to have an in with somebody who's in um, government, neutrally France or or uh, Scotland in different cases that we discuss. Um, Galton, we talk about how he just basically paid people to give him data and fill out um, survey cards um, to try to get data. The main the main change we talk about in the book where labor suddenly shows up is actually in the, the processing of data, and that's in World War II. So we take pains to illustrate how computation was largely born of a messy data science problem, digital computation. We, we spend some time at Bletchley Park and how digital computation came to pass there in order to deal with a very urgent, not a particularly mathematical problem. And we start seeing there a transition from data in the service of truth to data in the service of power or engineering and goals. And immediately, as that becomes very data and very labor intensive, rather, because you have to have streams of data and then you have to process all the possible effectively simulations of the German um, encryption device, you see a gendering of labor. So immediately when the job is broken into multiple parts and there's labor associated with different parts, immediately People at Blessy Park say, well, this is clearly men's work and this is clearly women's work. And again, it's useful to take that far away time because we can look at it and say, oh, well, that was that was very different. It's how sad that they didn't uh, realize the ways that they're perpetuating uh, inequalities and also in a way that they're doing themselves at a service as they're trying to to perform decryption you know, every day. But to see how inherent it is in the way that we look at problems and we somehow impose on a problem broken into parts, some idea that like certain parts are associated with one group of people and a different part of the job should be associated with a different group of people. And in this case, it comes along with a power dynamic as well. Yeah. And so that, that story of the, the use of relatively marginalized people, um, to do much of the work around data preparation, processing and collection is one that, uh, you know, pre-exists Bletchley Park is, 
at Bletchley Park is a great inflection moment that captures changes, uh, uh, you know, much more broadly, and that is very much at the heart of uh, the very large uh, apparatus that exists around current machine learning and AI and large corporations. And in most cases, we we don't have a very good sense of who is doing that work because much of it is uh, shrouded in corporate secrecy. But a number of scholars uh, and journalists have uh, you know peeked under the hood and managed to tell some amazing stories, uh, either through anthropological, ethnogra- ethnography, or through sort of great journalism. And we really want to stress that that's a very much a, a continuous process, that it's been only uh, ever getting larger uh, and not something that is just to sort of, as Chris says, something to sort of see as a past kind of uh, result. Um, it's very much uh, at the heart of our present. Hopefully you guys can help me make a quick clarification for our viewers. So uh, in World War II, the gendered work and the labor of making data was kind of a mechanical task. It was physically processing the data onto tapes and running those through machines. We're not using tapes anymore. And I know it's not the work that you guys specifically covered in this book, but you did mention it. What is sort of the data work that people are doing now with these large language models and huge AI apparatuses? Oh, go ahead, Matt. No, well, it, it ranges from everything from... Uh, uh, cleaning up the the data that is being automatically produced at large scale. So back then it was indeed dealing with some physical medium that caused uh, lots of difficulties and that was mechanically problematic. But part of it is very much um, transforming things into uh, into a format that then can be processed. But a lot of the work um, is pro- is in 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 is either doing things like content moderation at extremely large scale across a large number of languages. And one of the key problems of, of recent years, particularly if you look beyond um, uh, in, in, in the United States and Europe, is the lack of, of expertise uh, uh, in doing sort of content moderation. Another is the that many of these systems work by virtue of learning from human classification of particular things, whether it's videos or uh, or 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 or. or, or uh, or things that something like uh, Chat GPT is 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 writing, um, and classifying the quality of those, or saying what they're about, or this sort of thing, and these these large models only work because they learn from huge amounts of human classification. Um, and so, for example, in the production of something like Chat GPT, you have both uh, a lot of human evaluation uh, of uh, of uh, examples, um, but you also have human evaluation of of of, of how uh, compelling the examples are. So, in a lot of the conversations about ChatGPT recently, people have been saying, "Well, it's sort of." You know, it's so compelling, it's so remarkable that it grabs our attention. It's not accidental because large teams of people have been ranking different pieces of text, and the algorithms are designed to learn to reproduce the kinds of things that people find more compelling. This only happens through large amounts of distributed labor, and much of that is, you know, as I've said, shrouded under various kinds of secrecy. But it's a one of the fundamental structural principles of the labor that underlies what is currently called artificial intelligence. Maybe it's useful to think about the different eras of collecting data. One is the state era in which the state was gathering data largely for cryptanalysis. That was certainly the problem in World War II and at the start of the Cold War. At some point, those technologies, like literally those computers, had to be sold to the public when they were no longer being used as cutting edge instruments by NSA and other sort of proto NSA um, agencies. And there was a, a, a directed marketing campaign by companies like IBM to create a field of business intelligence, arguing that companies should move their um, their world from punch cards to uh, a digital world that, that, by the way, continues to this present day. Another era was the era of consumer devices that are ruling our, our personal, political, and professional realities. You know, somebody, so many people are not only getting the information in the palm of their hand, but they're using instrumented devices and instrumented softwares to perform so many transactions. And many of those are happening for free because companies were able to monetize that in various ways of selling or profiting from those personal data. ChatGPT, though, I think speaks to a, a, a new era in which there's simply so much content online 
that you can go about learning a language model from hoovering up some combination of free and licensed content and sometimes scraped violating the terms of services of different companies. Lots and lots of content online, which allows you to build language models, which perform um, sort of these tricks, you know, if, if, I, if I may put it, you know, I mean, it's, it's tricking people into people saying, oh, I'm seeing consciousness or I'm, this thing is giving me advice or it's convincing me to leave my wife or whatever in the case of different um, recent journalistic endeavors. But, you know, it's ultimately a, a, a trick. It's it's predicting the next world and word in the series, which is a, a trick that Claude Shannon suggested a long time ago. Uh, anyways, I, I would say in, in the different eras of collecting abundant data, there was sort of this, this pressing problem in the World War II and the Cold War thereafter, a corporate problem, a case, a, an era where we started instrumenting our lives and allowing every transaction to be tracked. And then this chat GPT case in which language models are being learned from abundant corpora of text available online. You guys talk about AI a lot in this book, and I'd like to get back to that. But before I do, I want to keep the focus on sort of data and the free flow of information. Um, you make uh, very clear in the book, in no uncertain terms, you're pushing against this uh, narrative that we have that uh, American tech exceptionalism is thanks to in part from the free flowing of information. We had a moment in the 70s, 60s, and 70s, where the public was concerned about our data, and we did not rise to the challenge, so we were able to monetize our data, and so we have this great you know, Silicon Valley, and you guys mentioned that there's a lot of government funding that went into technology companies, especially in the 50s. I was wondering if you guys would be interested in talking about that. Yeah, so certainly a lot of, uh, the story of computation, particularly in the States, is a story of abundant government support for nascent companies. So a lot of the companies that were early uh, computer companies were, where their initial customer was the federal government, usually under DOD concerns, or again, NS, somewhere in the intelligence community. And they were funding not only the hardware, but also the machine learning methods. So you can look back on the history of you know important early machine learning papers from the 50s and 60s, and many of them were funded by Air Force, Operation, Oper, uh, Office of Naval Research, sometimes the CIA. Um, so it's not a, it's not an independent story as though somehow like industry, like sprang full grown from its bootstraps. You, you know, a lot of the technologies, hardware and software and algorithms were directly funded by um, military concerns, both during World War II, but also in the Cold War, which continued to provide ample support for the development of that as a field, including data processing. Yeah, and and more than you know, on top of all that, the the U.S. military, in particular, provided for the development of incredibly capital-intensive industries, um, largely through the support of different kinds of private entities. And the there's there comes to be a bit of an illusion that the the kinds of products that are available, both hardware and then software. Um, by the 1970s on the market as if that had spun had emerged by itself uh, rather than being a reflection of uh, the, the, the the massive investment that made sort of very high quality components available very cheaply we don't get deep into that story but it, it, it really enables then certain kinds of uh, market actors to transition from an, or, or from a moment in which there's heavily du- heavy direct uh, federal uh, investment to one in which they're commercial entities that are supported by very different funding models, including uh, venture capital, among other sorts of things. But it's, it's, it's just not the case that you can tell a story where government support is not central to what is happening in different ways um, from the Second World War forward. Jake, just to get back to your question, you opened up by talking about the differences between 70s, 80s, and thereafter, and the opportunity to think about consumer protection. I think an important point there is the role of the state versus the role of private companies. Not the, not the question we went into, which was the state funding private companies, but in particular, who held all the data in the 1960s and 1970s? And who was it that individual citizens were concerned about? It was the state. So if you go back and look at the many of the the rights and protections and acts, you know, like FOIA and FERPA and plenty of other things that are part of our present day, those were all born out of concerns of government overreach in the 1960s and 1970s, not corporate overreach. So part of what 
the dynamic there of, of the um, an era where consumer protection was forefront was that the the data was held by the state and the power therefore was held by the state in a way that's very different than our present day in which power is diffused among multiple private companies with a very different accountability structure than government itself. Yeah, and there was this moment early in the 70s where this concern about data collection focused primarily on 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 the federal government and governments uh, more generally, but still had a there was a moment of concern about commercial data collection, and the corporations worked quite successfully to push that while they did collect data, there was no um, hard evidence that there were any harms that attended upon this, and that until such harms could. Come, could, could be shown, um, a light touch should be taken. But what happens between the 70s uh, into the 90s is that idea of the, of, of the you know, innocuousness of uh, corporate data collection moves from being something that's still sort of a question up in the air to being much more a, a part of a kind of natural story that data is you know, is the kind of property that a corporation would collect and should be treated as such. Um, and that therefore comes to support a sort of grand narrative of why that sort of corporate ownership of data then can spur the kind of uh, explosion of the internet economies that we get uh, after the turn of the millennium. And there were a lot of people who were very committed to pushing that story. So the the story that data ought to be uh, freely available to corporate actors to use and collect, and the story that that then was kind of a natural development that helped spur the economy. Neither of those is given. Um, though they're important narratives that circulate today, and those in, those narratives are pushed by people who are very interested in people believing them, um, and so it's not accidental that most of us come to hold those kinds of views um, because they were pushed very heavily. They don't actually track the history uh, is one of the things that we really want to show, and that opens moments for us to push back um, in all kinds of different ways if we collectively should choose to. Switching gears slightly to artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, you guys give a, a really great brief history of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and data's role in the development of uh, artificial intelligence from its early days to ChatGPT now. I was wondering if you guys would be interested in sharing with their audience kind of how data influenced AI's evolution. Yeah, well, that's another good story where it's kind of fun to seize on the original usage of a word. So artificial intelligence itself is is born in a an attempt to get money. And the, and the person who came up with the term is, is quite clear. He's on record as saying, I made up the term in order to get funding, uh, which in this case was a 1955 document proposing a conference in the summer of 1956. Uh, and the mathematician John McCarthy uh, made up the term to study the, the hypothesis that all aspects of human intelligence could be so precisely described as to be programmed. So it's really named after an aspiration rather than a method. And when they got together, it was quite clear that they were really um, casting about for what was going to be the method that would allow us to reach this aspiration of programming a computer. And you can almost hear in the way they were framing it that uh, a precursor was to understand our own human intelligence well enough that we could describe it on a computer. And that sort of set the initial trajectory, which to be clear, was not a data-driven trajectory, right? I mean, this was a field created mostly by logicians, or let's say mathematicians, uh, who had a particular way of doing things. And both because the technology wasn't there, the compute computation was there, there weren't abundant data sets, but also because their own vision of how they thought brains worked and just simply how they understood problems it was not pursued as a data problem. It took decades before other communities that had really solved real problems um, had methods which were sort of integrated into the, the artificial intelligence community. Many of those came via a community called machine learning. The other thing we try to do in this book repeatedly is to say to the reader, I, I pr usually implicitly, it's reasonable to be confused as to what these terms mean, because all of these terms mean different things in different decades and in different communities. Uh, 
So artificial intelligence in 1950s in the hands of mostly mathematicians clearly means a different thing than it means today. Yeah, and there's a you know the, 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 there's a clear difference in a kind of philosophy uh, of what it is to know that is in play, and a sense of what kind of intelligence that you want to um, that you want to emulate. So in in the sort of uh, the great early Cold War moment, um, as Chris said, the model was that of logicians and mathematicians and chess players, not that of empirical data collection. In fact, that was very much that kind of marginalized activity. Um, and that tracks very much in large scale phenomena that is happening in philosophy and cognitive science in linguistics that pushes against a kind of whole empiricist view of the world. And that philosophical self-image um, that was at the heart of artificial intelligence only slowly is eroded by this, uh, m- this much more empirical, uh, data-driven uh, mathematical domain, which didn't have a lot of prestige in the academy, um, but was highly funded by uh, the military and intelligence communities, and then comes to a certain kind of fruition um, in the 90s with the explosion of, of commercial data, such that a sort of lower level discipline, pattern recognition, and then machine learning comes to be re-sanctified as artificial intelligence, but involving a really dramatic shift in a philosophical vision of what it is to be intelligent that we are, we are living through. Jumping to now modern day with our data-based machine learning methods, uh, and you opened the book with this, which I really appreciate as a great framing device. What are the stakes? The stakes are what do we do in the face of extremely large automatic decision-making models that are built into uh, all sorts of facets of our existence, from the everyday interactions we have one-on-one with devices that we carry around us with us um, to very large decision making made by uh, by, uh, 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 by corporations, by banks, and other sorts of things that are making decisions, or and educational institutions that are making decisions about what kind of access to resources we have, um, what sort of things might be denied to us, uh, what sort of incarceration we might be subject to. Um, uh, and that that operates both at the sort of corporate, it operates at the federal, it operates at, 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 at a much more sort of global scale, particularly given that the corporations are, are cross-cutting. And it's happening not just in um, uh, you know extremely advanced economies, but by virtue of the ubiquity of devices around the world, it's happening to people in all sorts of places in the world. So the stakes really are, how is it that we want to think about the the place of various kinds of automatic decision tools, which are nowadays usually referred to as AI, um, in the very texture of our societies. Um, We are largely talking about broadly democratic societies, but these same conversations are happening in far more autocratic uh, societies. So it, and, and our sense is not one that sort of overly romanticizes a kind of human actor making great decisions because much of the story is the automization of extremely terrible bureaucratic uh, decision making and what happens when you you take that that sort of human based system and you build a system that reinforces and makes even more structural its set of biases so um, the stakes really are uh, about those kinds of decisions the stakes also fundamentally involve questions of uh, of the different facets of privacy that are so essential to us. The question of to what extent um, are are th- the things we do can remain secret from others. That to what extent the things we do can remain anonymous, um, and those are you know are, are, are sort of quite different. Um, and also the stakes of the, the activities we do, um, exposing or not exposing the people around us. Um, so I think the stakes are, uh, are, 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 are rather, rather enormous and range from all kinds of micro decisions to macro decisions. And uh, they likewise involve 
the promise of technologies that can improve all sorts of things, access to, uh, uh, you know, act, the, the ability of, of voice recognition to allow people who previously might not have been able to access uh, a computer, or other sorts of devices on the one side versus um, technologies that are built in such a way that they, they enable only certain classes of people to m make active use of them. Um, what more would you say? I mean, Chris, there's more to say, of course. Yeah. So I, I remember walking across campus with Matt one morning and saying to him, Matt, I finally realized that our class is about truth and power. So the stakes are in part about what is the impact of data on truth and data on power. When it comes to truth, I think in part one of the class, we try to spell out how um, this quantitative notion of hypothesis testing gives us a sense, and this arises 1920s through present day, that there is an algorithm for performing an experiment and revealing truth. And the algorithm is, is at this point, um, so automated and quantified that in many fields, that is, you know, a, a numerical procedure is a substitute for deciding that something is true. More recently, uh, in, the, in our present world, getting back to what I was saying earlier about a world in which so much of our uh, personal and professional realities are determined by private corporations. When it comes to media, we, we and in the role of news in, in establishing consensus, we ask around the ad model, and particularly the venture capital fueled ad model, what does it mean that our, our primary source of truth come to, coming to us in the palm of our hand is, is funded by, but also optimized for uh, the surveillance ad model? You know, let's let's think about what are the interests there and, and are they optimizing for um, things that we particularly want in terms of our, our own interests around norms, values, ethics, or consumer protection. And then getting back to this only earlier point about accountability to the state and accountability to companies being very, very different. So when, when data is in the hand of the state, it's sort of clear how we will go about uh, demanding accountability from the state. And, and again, getting back to what I was saying earlier, that's why we have so many privacy acts and protections and laws from the 60s and 70s. And when those the, that high power is in the hands of private companies, we don't have quite the teeth that we have when it comes to the state. You know, we have public appeals for ethics, for example, or we have the action of private individuals who work for these companies. It's a very diffuse way of trying to address what for many people is a, a challenge to their norms and a challenge to their conceptions of what ethics means. And we're running out of time here. So my last question for you guys actually has to do with ethics and data justice. Um, you've very clearly outlaid the stakes of what's going on here. So how do we move forward? A conversation about ethics is essential um, and clarity about it is essential. And but as the experience is in, in the recent few last few years about uh, the challenges of ethics boards and corporations really uh, brings to the forefront ethics without being integrated into institutions that give them power um, really ends up too often being a kind of smokescreen, not because the people doing it aren't doing extraordinary work and we know that they are, um, but very much from the frustration that if they are not granted a seat at the table in which they're able to make um, substantial decisions uh, about what sort of products are deployed or, or not deployed, or the nature of that deployment, then we've gotten ourselves into a real problem. So we want to stress both the fact that we need to have serious uh, conversations, both the philosophical conversations, but also conversations about how is it that you instrumentalize ethics such that they work in various kinds of, uh, you know, different kinds of organizations. But not just that, that sort of conversation, but equally a conversation of their, how do you empower it um, in different ways and uh, in the way that in the the research apparatus of the university, anything dealing with human subjects, is constrained by certain rules, federal rules in the United States, similar kinds of rules in other parts of the world. How you do that in a corporation is 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 more challenging. But to not recognize the this, this salience of power is to end up having a sort of artificial enclosure of ethics that renders it often um, powerless. That chapter on ethics is actually called the battle for ethics. So our, our discussion of ethics is quite solidly um, grounded in fights. And, and we try to be analytic about where is the power 
in our chapter about what we think is to be done, we try to be analytic about uh, state power, corporate power, and people power, and how um, all of the live contests that are existing right now are ultimately going to determine our future together. In the chapter on ethics, we also talk about one particular conception of applied ethics, which is about not a checklist, but a tension among different principles, one of which is justice, and, and in which we should think about, well, what do we mean by justice? Do we mean equality? Do we mean fairness? Do we mean oppression? Um, and actually, we, we do mention data justice in particular as one way of framing the conversation about power away from mere tech fixes, right? Because when we think about when we think about all of ethics and reduce it to fairness, it sort of invites this technical approach where it's just about putting in the right term in your loss function and optimizing for that instead. And we try to frame it as, uh, well, actually, there's, there's more to ethics than um, changing your loss function. This has been really great. Thank you both for taking the time to talk with me about this. Uh, how Data Happened can be found uh, online and linked in the program description notes. Thank you both for taking the time to talk with me. Thank you for the great questions. Yeah, thanks for having us.